So we can use matrices to create linear codes where the code is going to be the null space of a matrix. But we want to pick our matrix A. I mean, we have a lot of freedom on how we can choose the matrix. So we want to pick a matrix uh, so that we can encode the, 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 the words, the messages in an effective way. And we also want high efficacy when it comes to error detection and error correction. And so what we're going to do over the next couple lectures is describe a very simple scheme of encoding and decoding messages that will give us a very easily a one error correction uh, level with, again, very little effort with how we construct these matrices. So we're going to start off very, very naive right now. We're going to start off with a matrix A, where A is going to be an N minus M by M matrix. Right? So I'm going to write that down. A is going to be an N minus M by M matrix. Seems kind of weird, but follow me with it on this one. Uh, this matrix A, will I'll explain a little bit later how we choose A, but for the moment, let's let A be a random matrix. Who cares? Uh, with this matrix, we can then build a new matrix H, which we're going to take A augment the, the appropriately sized identity matrix. Uh, so we want to put the identity matrix here. It has to have the same number of rows as A does. A has N by M, or excuse me, N minus M many rows here. Um, and so that will make H into an N by M, has the same many, has the same number of rows that A does, but it'll then be, it'll have N many columns. We added, we added some more columns there. So we then create this matrix H uh, for which we're going to call this the canonical parity check matrix. So this matrix will be used to create our linear code. And if we choose A in an appropriate way, we can actually have some parity check bits inside of our code words based upon how A is chosen. Like again, we'll talk about how we choose A in a future lecture. Now associated to the parity check matrix, uh, is what we're going to call the standard generator matrix. We're going to call it G. G is going to be a matrix uh, which is going to be N by M, in which case we are going to put on the bottom of the matrix the same matrix A, and on top of it we're going to put the matrix, the identity matrix, which is going to be the appropriately sized identity matrix here. So the number of columns of the identity has to match up with A, so there were M many of those. So there's going to be M many columns in A. And then how many rows are you going to get? Well, A has N minus M many rows. The identity will have M many rows, so you're going to get N minus M plus M, which is where the N comes from. So G here is going to be an N by M matrix, all right? And remember, H is going to be N minus M by N. And so we get this generator matrix. So what's so important about these matrices? Well, they set aside a very important relationship. So notice here that if we were to multiply together the matrices H and G, well, H is this augmented matrix, A augment the identity of appropriate size. Um, G is likewise the identity augmented A. And so when we do matrix multiplication, so this is what often someone calls a blocked, a block matrix or a partition matrix, for which because the sizes are compatible, you actually multiply them out, not necessarily term by term, but by block by block. And what happens is you're going to get if you think about like row times column, you're going to get A times the identity plus the identity times A. We add these together. Well, A times the identity on the right is going to give you A. And then the identity on the left of A is also going to give you A again. So you end up with A plus A. But since we're working mod 2, every matrix is its own additive inverse. So A plus A is equal to the 0 matrix Z, uh, 0 right there. And so in particular, the product of H and G is equal to zero. This is a very common thing that happens with matrix multiplication. Their products could be zero. By no means do I claim these matrices are non-singular or anything in that direction. All right, so let's investigate this a little bit further. Let's say that we have a specific received message X. Uh, well, actually, sorry, this will be, this may, uh, let, let X be a uh, unencoded message, right? We just have a vector, so uh, it'll be something that belongs to Z2M. Remember, Z2M was the message space. Uh, these are going to be the messages we want to send, but they haven't been encoded yet. If we multiply our message by G, we'll call that vector Y. And we're going to see in a moment that Y is then the encoding. It's the encoded. It's the encoding of the of the message X here. Basically, multiplication by this matrix G is the encoding function. We'll see why that is. 
Well, if you multiply h by y, well, y was just the same thing as g times x. Um, and so h times gx, well, like we saw a moment ago, h times z is going to be the zero matrix, and zero matrix times any vector would be the zero vector right here. And so this tells us that y actually belongs to the null space of h, which remember the null space is our code, that's c. So notice that we took a message x, and by multiplying by this generator matrix G, we turned it into something that's a code word. So that's what I mean by it's in this encoding process. Now, if you take, if you take things like G of X right here, this is just a typical element that belongs to the so-called column space of G. So the column space can be defined in two ways. Um, the way that's appropriate here is this: we're going to take the, all of the vectors of the form G X, uh, such that X belongs to uh, Z to M in this situation, but you can also define this to be the span of the columns, whoops, the columns of G, and that's actually where it gets its name. Uh, but this is the interpretation that's helpful really right here. If you think about matrices actually as functions of these linear transformations, uh, you have this map where X transforms into G times X. You can think of, oh, G is this function, in which case this is just this is just the image of the function associated to G. That, that's what this column space is. And so what we've now seen is that anything of the form G times X lives inside the null space. So the column space of G is then a subgroup, or better yet, it's a subspace of the null space of H, right? So this is, this is a subspace inside of another subspace. And I actually claim that these two things are equal to each other. To see that, let's actually consider uh, the dimensions of these spaces, right? So G, for example, it does contain a portion of the identity right here. And so this is going to tell us that the rank of G is actually going to equal M. Um, because basically this matrix is, you know, you already have an identity on the top. If you want to row reduce this thing, you just have to kill off all the A's on the bottom, which can be done. So this thing would always, this matrix is always going to row reduce. It's RREF will look like the identity over the zero matrix right there. And so it's rank, the number of pivot positions, um, is going to be M. So the rank of this matrix, G, is M. Now, the rank is also the dimension of the column space. It's the dimension of the image here. So the dimension of this thing is going to be M. So we have this M-dimensional subspace living inside of, well, how big is the null space? Let's think about that for a second. Well, the null space of H, if we come back up to H, right, the, you see right here that H has also an identity inside of it. This matrix um, is gonna have N many columns. And you have this identity, which is gonna be N many, you have N minus M many, um, you have N minus M many pivots in there. But because you have the identity, everything in A can be written as a combination of these, I, uh, of the columns of the identity matrix. Therefore, everything over here, we can think of as non-pivots. And so how many non-pivots are there gonna be? Well, A here has M many columns. And so this matrix H is gonna have M many non-pivot positions, mm -hmm. uh, which would count the nullity of the matrix is the dimension of the null space. That's gonna be M right here. And so this is what we're seeing here is that we have an M dimensional space sitting inside of an M dimensional space. Well, from linear algebra, if if you have a subspace inside of another one and they have the same dimension, that actually forces equality. So since the dimension of the column space of G is equal to the, column, the, the dimension of the null space of H, which of course is just the rank and the nullity, this implies that the two spaces are actually equal to each other. So the, the column space of G is equal to the null space of H, which H here is the code right? The null space of H is the code, which means that if you take a message and you multiply by G, that gives you a code word. So the encoding process is essentially just multiply by G. Uh, let's look at a specific example here. Let's say that we want to encode the eight words that belong to Z23. So we have a three-bit message. So we have like 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. You, you get the idea there, right? So how can we encode this message here? Well, there's, there's a, two options here. One option um, would be to solve the, the system of equations, which I'll come back to that one in a second. The other option is you just multiply each of these vectors by the matrix G. So if you take 0, 0, 0 and times it by G, you're going to get 
the zero vector, zero, 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 zero. If you multiply g by zero, zero, one, you're gonna get zero, zero, one and one, zero, one. And so let's verify that calculation for, us for a moment, right? If we take our matrix G and we times it by the word zero, zero, one, right? You take the first row times the vector right there, you're gonna end up with a zero. Then take the second row times this, you end up with a zero again. You take the third row times that, you're just gonna get back a one right here. Then I'm gonna put a space here just to make it a little bit easier to read. If you take the second or the fourth row times the vector, you get a one. Uh, the next one would be zero, and then the last one would be one. And so that's where you get this. You can just multiply the, your code word by the matrix, and that's the encoding process, just multiply by it. And so you end up with something like this. And this will happen for each and every one of these things. Now, the way that we've constructed our parity check matrix and our generator matrix, one thing I want you to notice is that the first three bits is always the original message with this scheme. So you can see how decoding will be easy, right? Um, if we know we have the correct uh, message received, then you just ignore the last three bits and you get back the first three. Now with the original message. And so these bits right here are often referred to as the information bits. The information bits, because this was the information that we actually want to transfer. But what do these other three bits do? These are what we call our check bits. These check bits are essential in the decoding process. Now, yes, we can get back the original message by ignoring the last three bits. But we have to know, did we receive the message correctly? Or was there an error in the process whatsoever? Were there, was there an error? The check bits will help us in that regard. We'll talk about that. Uh, well, you know, actually we could just talk about it right now for a second. Uh, so there's a theorem right here that if we have our matrix H, like so, if this is a canonical parity check matrix, then the code is the null space. It'll consist of all of these message all of these messages y you know these are the encoded messages right like i said the first m bits are the information bits and then the n minus the last n minus m bits are these uh these check bits and if this was an authentic code word we should have that hx is equal to zero like we've said here and so we see that the null space of h is equal to the column space of g the standard generator matrix this is just summarizing all of this stuff uh, we've done so far. So if we start off with this canonical parity check matrix, we can create this n by m block linear code, and we can use the, the matrix G to encode messages. Now, if you just want to encode a single metric message, just multiply it by G. But if you want to produce the entire code all at once, uh, then it might actually be better to use the null space in this consideration here. And we did this in a previous example, right? If we have the matrix H right here, um, so you have 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, right? You have this parity check matrix. Notice here you have the identity, right? You have the identity right here as well. The matrix A in play was this one right here. This is our matrix A. 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. This likewise is our matrix A in play. Okay? We could find the, co the code by computing the null space of the matrix H right here, which I'm going to kind of skip over the details here. If you write this as a homogeneous system of equations, you get the following. Um, if you row reduce that using this, the usual uh, row, reduc row reduction techniques, Gaussian elimination, uh, you get the following. And so what this tells us here is that we're going we're gonna to actually set x4, x5, x6 as our uh, as our, what, what, what's the word here? These are going to be our dependent variables. We're going to treat x1, x2, x3 as our free variables uh, because after all, that's the original message, uh, x1, x2, x3, which could be whatever it wants. The x4, x5, x6, our checks bits are then determined by the original message right here. And so we can then come up with a basis for this thing. Uh, notice here, our typical vector x looks like, well, x wants whatever it wants, x2 is whatever it wants, x3 is whatever it wants, x4 will be x2, plus x3, um, x5 will be x1 plus x2, and then x6 will be x1 plus x3. And so if you break this up into three vectors, there's the vector that only involves x1, that's gonna be x1 times 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. Because you can see that there was an x1 in the first position. We see that right here. There was an x1 in the last two positions. We see that right here as well, okay? For the, for the second one, if we look at the x2, so we have in the second spot, the fourth spot, and the fifth spot, we get this vector right here, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. 
And then for X3, we have one in the third spot, the fourth spot, and the fifth spot. We get 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0, 1. Like there. So we get our three, our three vectors, which give us a basis for this null space right here. Um, and then if you look at the eight possible combinations of these three vectors, you get the entire, uh, the entire code, which contains these eight vectors right here. So in fact, this gives us a, this gives us a six, three uh, linear code right here. And again, this gives us the exact same code we did if we multiply by the matrix. Uh, the two will do the same thing. You can either take the column space of the generator, or you can take the null space of the parity check matrix. Now, why does the why does H get the name parity check? Well, that's because you see these things right here, right? These right here are our checks that when you take, you know, let's say we received, uh, you know, let's say we take the the message right here, one zero one 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 zero, and let's say that when it's transmitted, there's an error in the first bit, so we get zero zero one 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 zero. So what we can do is that we can check to see did our message get sent correctly. We know the first three bits are the message, um, but did it get sent correctly? We look at the check bits, right? The first check would be add together x2 and x3. So, you know, okay, we do that. So we take x2 and x3. So we just take zero plus one, that should equal one, um, which is what we have for that. So that checks off, okay? So then we do the next one. The next one is x1 plus x2. So right, if we add those together, uh, we should get zero plus zero, which equals zero, um, which is like, eh, that's not what happened. We got a one right there. So at this moment, we've now detected an error, right? There's an error detection in there. Now we, we, we could do that just by multiplying by the matrix H. We've seen that before, but notice what happens on the next bit. If we do the last check, X1 plus X3, that should equal X6. If we take X1 and X3, uh, that's gonna be zero plus one, which equals one. And so, eh, we see that the sixth bit is also a mistake. So what's in common between five and six? Notice that X1 is involved in both five and six. And since there was two errors right there, it's like eh, the error was on the first bit. So therefore the, the original message should have been one zero one and then one one zero, which then says, oh, we were trying to transmit one zero one. So we were able to not just detect, we could correct the the error based upon these check bits. Uh, that's how they come into play. Now, it turns out in practice, there's a much simpler way of doing this, which we'll see in the next lecture. But I just wanna show you right now that we choose the matrix A so that we have these type of checks in the transmission so that if there is an error, we could potentially correct them.